Hello and welcome to Beyond the Bio. This week I'm joined by Andrew Armitage, who is the founder of multi-award winning digital agency A Digital. With over 20 years experience building websites for organisations in the public, private and third sectors, Andrew works at a strategic level to ensure that they are maximising their online opportunities and performance. Andrew is also the author of the Amazon best-selling book, Holistic Website Planning. He's also the host of the Client Side podcast, where he captures insights from guests in senior digital roles, talking about the impact of digital in organizations on their people, culture, and performance. So Andrew knows his stuff, and I'm delighted to have him on the show talking about all things SEO. So let's get stuck in. Welcome to Beyond the Bio, Andrew Armitage. And when I do my intros, sometimes I quite like to highlight how I met my guests because sometimes they are interesting stories. And I think that would be relevant with you because we met, was it 2019? It was, wasn't it? Yeah, just before everything all went a bit wrong in 2020. A bit wrong. Yeah, absolutely. So we met on a business accelerator. And the the reason why I think that is particularly interesting is because I'm always talking about networking and meeting people, meeting great people in great circumstances. And I think that would definitely be one that I would highlight. And I often talk about the fact that we are in a, what are we, an accountability group, a mastermind, but of both, I guess, and the, the value that you can get from those kind of relationships. Yeah, accountability, definitely. But friendship as well, you know, over the course of the last, what, 2024, we're sort of five years, aren't we, nearly now? That's mad, isn't it? That is mad. And for this particular episode, we are talking all things SEO. And it was one of my team members that said, you should totally do an episode about SEO. And I was like, I know nothing about SEO, but I think I know someone who might. And this was obviously the opportunity to bring you in and get you on the show. Yeah, no, it sounds great. Thank you for having me. Well, let's get stuck in then. So first off, for people that don't really understand what SEO is, tell us what it is and why it actually matters in the context of people that are listening to their show and wanting to raise their profile. Yeah, so search engine optimization or SEO is effectively trying to get yourself found and making yourself visible in search engines, which for most people means Google. Google is the one that is getting the lion's share of search. And to be honest, the rules are generally the same across different search engines. So it is essentially maximizing your visibility in search engines. And obviously, from a personal branding point of view, that's really important because it's helping you get found. It's a sign of credibility. It also helps people to see other things that you might have been involved with. Those could be uh, non-business related activities, other achievements, awards that you might have won. So it's about building a bigger picture that when people search for you, you're coming up in the results and people can find and see the sorts of things that you've been involved with. And of course, all that adds to credibility. Mm, Absolutely. And just while you were talking, I was just thinking about the fact that all these things pop up. What happens if something less desirable pops up? So something pops up online that you'd rather wasn't. Can you do anything about that? Well, it's a difficult one, to be perfectly honest. What goes online generally stays online. I think it depends on on circumstance. I mean, Google are obviously indexing pretty much any content that goes online. And, you know, in some cases, they'll argue around content that is there for the public good or for, for public interest, which or legitimate interest is technically what they call it. And of course, that's the sort of thing that journalists will often reference when they're talking about stories in the news. So it, it, it's, it's difficult. too bad. And, <laughs> It can be really difficult to have content taken down. If you own that content, then of course, you know, it's within your gift to be able to do that. You can take it off your own website or you can prevent certain pages from being indexed on your website by search engines. If it's on someone else's website, then unless it's defamatory or you've got a really strong case that shows it's not true, it's it's not something that happened or something that might have been said about you. And then, of course, you know, the nuclear option is legal channels. But in between that, there's not really a great deal that you can do. 
other than try and drown it out. You know, you can create content that will essentially try and dilute that content. And there's a number of different factors that go into what helps particular pages rank in the search engines. So if you get featured on a piece of content by, for example, someone like the BBC, BBC News has got huge reputation and authority. So Google are going to take that into account when they rank those results. So if it was something that happened fairly recently or is related to a time-bound search, then that's going to be really difficult to try and nudge down the search results. But over time, yeah, you can try and dilute that content by effectively replacing it or talking about other things that perhaps might be more positive, let's say. Okay, great advice. I've noticed fairly recently that page one of Google is much longer than it used to be. I feel like I keep scrolling and scrolling and don't get to the end of it. What is going on there? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So Google are all about usability. And really, that starts from the simplicity of their search homepage. You know, it's really simple. There is just a search box. But actually, search is very complicated, especially if you start and look at the psychology of how people use search and and the sort of intent of what they're looking for or what they're trying to achieve at that particular point in time. And Google are always doing research, of course, as you'd expect. They're very much a data-led company. And they know that now a lot of people are spending time searching on mobile devices. And of course, if you're on a mobile device, having to, you know, perhaps you're on a slower connection and having to click through more pages to see the results is a little bit of a frustration. And in fact, we also know that not many people click through to page two. So it's actually a benefit to see that the, they've taken away the pagination or the links through to subsequent pages. And uh, it's easier to use on a mobile device. So you, know, you can continually scroll but actually it's giving you a better chance of getting found because you don't necessarily see the boundary of the distinction between page one and page two. Typically it might be separated by some ads, but uh, it's actually easier now to sort of be found even if you're on page two. So are there still pages though? There are still pages. There are still pages. Longer. Yeah, yeah, pretty much exactly that. I mean, you'll have seen, obviously when you do a Google search, you get the little snippet at the top, which will say, you know, showing X number of results out of X million pages found on the web those are still in the search it's just that they've taken out the page boundaries so it's easier to access the information and of course really what google wants to do is keep you on their site google thrives and ultimately makes their revenue from ads so if you're on a longer page they can show more ads they can show more featured content and snippets or youtube videos and things like that all of which ultimately helps you stay within their ecosystem but like i say It does bring that benefit. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But it it does bring that benefit of, you know, previously people just wouldn't click through to page two. But actually, if you're not quite on page one, you're just hovering around that threshold, then you've got a better chance of actually being found. Mm. Are there certain platforms or types of content that are more likely to rank higher on Google? I've not seen evidence with different platforms. So whether your website is built on WordPress or Wix or Shopify, I've not seen any evidence that suggests any of those particular platforms will perform better than another. Really what it comes down to is content. And if you create good quality content, that's the first thing that Google are looking to index. But other website ranking factors do come into play. So your site has to be performant. It's got to be quick and uh, and snappy in terms of its performance. And sometimes if you're on, say, a platform like Wix, you upload a large image, you can't necessarily manage or influence the performance of those pages because Wix is a, it's an all-in-one system. So that could sort of be a negative in that sense. But trying to make sure that you've got good, clean, well-structured content is always going to be your number one priority when it comes to trying to get found. And really, you need to be thinking about what would I search for if I was looking for myself? Or if I needed a service or a person that has got my particular skills, what's the sort of thing that I'd be searching for? Obviously, you then you match up your copy around some of those key phrases and some of the language that people might use. And that's going to, uh, those are the main ranking factors that are going to get you ranked. Now, where there is another difference is your authority, the authority of your website. Now, of course, when you're talking about SEO in a personal branding context, you're wanting to demonstrate your authority. Now, that's great. The likes of you and I, we can go on a website and we can cross-reference various bits and pieces and we can have a look at that. We can come to our own conclusion about the authority or credibility a particular individual might have. But actually, Google doesn't have the eyes and ears that we do. They've got different set of eyes and ears. And what you've really got to do is try and join the dots to make it as easy as possible for Google 
to determine that you have that authority and therefore justification to rank well in their search results. Mm, interesting stuff. One of the things that I notice when I Google clients, because when we take someone on, we Google them and we see what's already out there and try and help them work out how to improve all of those things. But one of the things I notice when we search for clients is that their social media profiles pop up and they're usually, if they've got a reasonably distinctive name, quite high up. So sometimes we'll see their LinkedIn profile above their company website and things like that, which always surprises me. It is, it, And sometimes as well, it will be a social media platform that they don't actually even use that often. So do the social media platforms, do some of them rank more highly than other ones? It all really comes down to reputation. So if you've got a personal website, realistically, you're never going to sort of develop a reputation that's stronger than a platform like X or Facebook or LinkedIn. Because there's so many different factors that go into the way that Google looks at ranking a website. Obviously, someone like LinkedIn or X or even other platforms like a Forbes magazine or BBC, they've got this credibility and the reputation in technical speak, domain authority, that says to Google, you know, these are people that we can trust. So if we've got a link on, say, a BBC page that links through to a personal website page, it's generally speaking likely to be a link that we can trust. So yeah, th- trying to compete with the social media platforms, you're never going to be able to do with your own personal website. But obviously those sites, the, the social media platforms, they've got the authority, they've got the user base, they've got their own reputation that they're trying to manage. And you obviously, it depends what you're searching for as well. If you're searching for someone's name, very often that will be in the URL that LinkedIn uses for your profile. You can also customize that URL as well. So uh, you know, if you are searching for someone's name, that's going to help you come up. Uh, and obviously, like you say, if it's a name that's perhaps a little bit more unusual, then you're perhaps likely to rank higher on there. And I always believe that people should have a personal website because it's something that you own and something that you can influence and control with the content that goes on it. What's to say that LinkedIn one day just suddenly changes their ranking algorithm or they change the content that they're going to allow on the site and suddenly some of the content you might previously have created has disappeared. They change their policies. It does happen. And then some of those examples I've given might be a little bit extreme. It's probably unlikely that you'd suddenly lose a load of content that you've posted onto a social channel. But we know they change the policies. And as we had the other day, we know that some of these sites can go offline as well. So having control and ownership of your own content helps you to build up your own reputation. And ultimately, you're not necessarily going to compete directly with some of those sites, but you want your site to come in with the listings alongside them. You know, if I'm Googling somebody and I'm wanting to know, for example, I'm looking for a speaker for an event, I'd love to see their own website. I'd also love to see their social profiles all on the same page. And if they are together, you know, it gives me a sense that actually this person's active on social media, they're active over here, they've got their own website, perhaps they're doing podcasts, they're posting in various different places or platforms or publications. All of that suddenly, very quickly, gives me a real sense that actually this is someone who has been deemed credible by search engines and therefore either worth listening to or worth paying attention to or or going to their events or hiring them to speak at an event. And I've got a great recent example, actually, that feeds in really nicely to that in that I spoke at an event in London last week that the organisers for that event had found me from Googling. I think they said they Googled inspirational female speakers and my personal website popped up next to my social media channels and they inquired and that was where the booking came from so this stuff works right Uh, totally it does of course it does um you know there is so much competition out there and it's really interesting that you've got a sense of what that person was searching for i asked them uh, well there you go you know and and that's a key part you've got to you know this is a two-way relationship that you've got to try and build with your audience. And that's just you know, day one of marketing, trying to connect with your audience. But if you think of SEO as really just you know, strategic marketing, what do you want to be known for? What do you want to be found for? And those really are you know, the first thing that you should be thinking about in terms of building your profile and, uh, and making sure that you're found. And it's not that you'd created a page that says Sophie Millican speaker or award-winning speaker or what have you, you've actually used keywords that have helped someone to find you. They didn't know your name, 
Otherwise, they could have come straight to you. And that's the really key point. You don't necessarily want to optimize around your name. Of course, it depends on what your objective is. You should really be optimized around your name quite naturally. You know, if other people are talking about you, linking up to your website or linking to your social media profiles, you'll find your name becomes optimized matter. And the same thing happens with company names. So it's about what do you want to be known for? You know, are you a speaker in a particular sector? Have you achieved a particular scientific breakthrough? You know, these are the types of things that people may end up searching for that leads them to you, even though they may not have heard of you. Mm. And on that point around names, what advice have you got for anyone that's got a common name who wants to rank highly? Because that's a real challenge, isn't it? Yeah, I think by extension of what we were just talking about, you know, what again, what do they want to be known for? Some people might have a particular focus in a certain sector. Some might be in a certain geography, although I think we see that less these days, given the way the world is. So uh, you know, making sure that you are sort of thinking about, again, that thing that people might need from you. What's the unique value that you have to offer? Because you know, there could be... <laughs> let's. <laughs> Pick a name, John Smith. You know, there will be tens of thousands of John Smiths, and there may even be some that exist in the same space, the same sector. But I think a lot of people, if they know it's or it looks like a common name, they perhaps type the name in, they might look down the first few results and think, oh, I'm not quite sure here. So it's about trying to make sure you've got, you know, in the little snippets that Google provides in the search results, something that tells them that it's the right person, that you work in that particular sector or you've achieved this particular goal, you've won this particular award. Maybe you're an award-winning marketer or you're a, a breakthrough medic in some particular field, making sure that that particular achievement that you want to be known for is very closely linked to your name. So it appears in the search results on Google. But also, again, if I don't know your name, I'm finding you based on that particular skill or achievement that you've made. Great advice. So it's linking it to what you want to be known for and getting lots of content out, basically. Yeah, content is king. Content is always king when it comes down to search. Absolutely. So thinking about Google in particular, because obviously that's the, the, the biggest thing. When I'm looking at Google, I can see all these tabs across the top, right? So I've got images, videos, news, etc., as, as well as that main page one. What is the relevance of having hits on these different tabs? Yeah, so Google provides those as, as basically a way to narrow down the search. You know, Google is indexing pretty much every piece of content that goes online that they can. There's certain things that they can't get to that'll be blocked. So from a user experience point of view, I'm coming onto Google. If I'm wanting to find something very specific, depending on my use case, I might be looking to find an image that I can use to promote a speaker or an event. That helps me just to narrow down all the results based on images alone. You might want to be looking for video content or news content that, again, could be picked up by any number of the various news channels and publications. So the news in particular can look for news articles rather than just blog posts. You're probably not going to find that your personal blog that you might add to once a week, you're probably not going to find those pages in the news section. However, if you've been featured on third party press and external publications, that's where you will. Because again, they've got that authority and the credibility, so you'll get found there. So it's all about trying to maximize your reach and visibility. So whether people are coming to do a general search, which of course, you know, it, their intent at that point could be anything. And, and intent's a really interesting area. You know, what are they looking for? What are they trying to do? And if you look at keywords that people use to find your site, you can actually start and understand a little bit more about what their intent is at that time. You know, are they just casually browsing, perhaps looking for information or, or advice? Or are they looking to do something a little bit more proactive, you know, wanting to book a speaker? And understanding how people are using the keywords to find your website and uh, your properties online is really helpful because obviously that means you can use either more or less of those keywords in content going forwards. So like I say, it's all about trying to maximize the user experience that people have with Google. Positive user experience on Google means you go back to Google for the next search. And of course, that's an opportunity for them to show ads. So you know, SEO is very much about helping you get found. But Google knows that if they're maximizing the experience and helping this content to come up and provide accurate results, you're going to go back to the service and that obviously helps their business. So it's a bit of a two-way street. It helps you, but you're also helping Google in that sense as well. Mm. 
Mm. So if I was to Google my name, a Google Knowledge Panel pops up, Mm -hmm. which looks super cool. But what actually is a Google Knowledge Panel? And is there any value in having one? It definitely does have value. It is oh, essentially, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's it's quite an achievement, in fact. I mean, it's not something that you can tell Google to do for you. Ultimately, it comes down to Google finding lots of information and being able to draw the dots between them, between all those different properties that you've been featured online behind the scenes. So if they can see that you've been referenced in various press materials, you might have been on a speaker's event website, you've got your own website, you've got your social media website, and so on, depending on the ultimate amount of coverage that you've had, Google will say, look, we're seeing this content come up on various sites that have got really good domain authority. This person is someone worth paying attention to. And it might be as simple as they've appeared in, you know, maybe uh, some element of popular culture like a film. You know, that could be quite an easy thing for some people to achieve, obviously, if you're in that film space. But for the likes of you and me who are running businesses, speaking and so on, it's all about creating content and the breadth of content as well that can be found across various different properties. But yeah, that knowledge panel is essentially saying to people who are looking you up, this person's made it, you know, they've achieved a certain level of credibility across the web. And we've been able to draw the dots between all of those different things. And we want to make sure that, you know, this person gets featured. That sounds pretty cool. I always wondered what the value of it was. So uh, good to know that it's useful. I, I just like the fact, and actually I haven't Googled myself for quite a while, so I probably should. But what I always liked was that it linked up all my social media profiles and it kind of had everything in the same place and it kind of, it looked quite serious. So I thought. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and of course it's right at the top of the page. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's more real estate which is committed to, to your profile. And that can only be a good thing if you're wanting to be found for it. So you get that panel in the top right-hand corner. You might then have several references down the left-hand side. And actually what research has shown is when people look on a website, and particularly search results, if you imagine a letter F, if you overlaid a capital F on the search results, so people will look across the top, across to the right-hand side, and then they'll go down the list of results. So if you've got that knowledge panel, they're likely to see that first. And then as they scroll down and they can see other results, it it all backs up as to the reason why that knowledge panel existed in the first place. And I feel like I know the answer to this. I'm guessing to try and get a Google knowledge panel, you just need to put more good quality content out there so Google can join the dots and create one for you. Yeah. When, when you're talking about SEO, you say it once, you say it again, it's content is king. And making sure that... Each of the different properties where you're you're likely to be ultimately all point back to your website. Inbound links to your website is one of the uh, primary ranking factors. It's uh, the way I always explain it is if you've got if you've got a website which has got 10 votes and a website that's got 100 votes or the equivalent to inbound links, the more popular one is the one with 100 inbound links. So that is likely to have a greater impact on your visibility. However, if the topics of those websites are wildly different, then it might be that the one with 100 inbound links is not quite as performant. It might be the one that with the 10 links is is better performing because those 10 links are so much more focused. Perhaps they're all around the same theme or the same topic. So it's not just about you know, having lots of links into your website from the various different places that you might appear. And of course, you know, in search engine terms... <laughs> can get a little bit technical not every link is a link worth having and some links can be blocked as well so they're not actually followed by search engines and in fact i think if you're published on a lot of the um, online news publications like forbes for example they uh, sneakily add a little bit of a no follow attribute to the link so while it might link back to your website which of course is a good thing or it could link through to your linkedin profile it doesn't necessarily carry the reputation from forbes back into your own website why would they do that Uh, because they're promoting themselves and not you, in a nutshell. They don't want to find there's lots of people who are really piggybacking off their brand. And because there's a known value in a site like Forbes linking to an individual website, a third-party website, they will often say, well, look, we don't want to have any sort of discrimination or we don't want to say we're going to link to some but not the others because this person's more worthy than this person. So it's often just a blanket rule that they'll have at a, at a publishing level that any link that they include to a third party site will have a no follow attribute. You may be able to challenge them on it and some may 
be able to lift that but that that all comes down to the individual publication interesting so if someone listening right now is just starting out on their profile raising journey what quick wins are going to get them ranking on page one of google yeah, so I would always suggest having a look at the results in the eyes of a potential customer or as someone that you want to find you. So if you're really wanting to build your profile as a speaker, think about the type of topics that you talk about and Google them. You know, look, pretend you're running an event, pretend you're going to host this event and you're looking for someone who you know, fits your criteria. What are you going to type in? What are you going to search for? What sort of things are you going to want to cross-reference? So you're going to want to look at their social profiles as well as perhaps their personal website. Are you going to want to look to see if they've been referenced in the news at all? So think about what you would do if you were running an event and you're wanting to be found as a speaker and then make sure you're, you're implementing those things on your website. So I wouldn't worry too much about optimizing around your name. You know, like we said earlier, think about the type of topics that you speak about. So if it's empowering women in business, then absolutely go after that kind of topic and make sure you're talking around the topic. Use similar keywords that could be entrepreneurial women, for example, that go into pieces of content. So you're building up various different blog posts or, or articles, or it doesn't even have to be blog posts, but paragraphs on your website that talk around this theme. And the more you digress from that theme, the more you're actually diluting what Google thinks your site's likely to be about. So stay focused, stay on topic and build content. So that's something that you can do within your own control. And then obviously you want to get things like testimonials. And if people are leaving testimonials, get them to link back to your website, but make sure there's a, a follow attribute rather than a no follow attribute. Then you can benefit from other sites' reputations and you get those inbound links. Just good housekeeping on your website, making sure that you know, every page is a new opportunity to optimize for keywords. So you know, a lot of these site builders, they might just take the page title and put that in the title section. It's the bit that you see in the tab. You can't really see it these days now because, well, certainly not my device, you've got that many tabs. But, but Google still looks at those titles that go on pages because what they're basically saying, does the rest of the content match the title? So if you're going to have an about us page or an about me page, for example, make sure it's not just saying about me. A lot of the site builders like Wix will just automatically put that page title in based on the heading that you've created on the page. So make sure that it's about Sophie Millican or it's uh, you know, information about inspiring women's entrepreneurial speaker or, or whatever it might be. But you've got an opportunity to use different keywords on every page. So so make sure that you're not just allowing the default option from whatever platform you're building your website on. And then, of course, creating content. It comes back to creating content on a regular basis and obviously getting those inbound links and making sure that you're, you're just continually creating new content for Google to index. Awesome. Some really, really great advice there, Andrew. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. If someone listening wants to connect with you, where is the best place for them to find you? So the best place to find me is uh, at adigital.agency. That's the agency that I run, but I'm also on LinkedIn, just typing a search in for Andrew Armitage. I know I'm coming up. I Rather sadly, I do Google myself from time to time, as, uh, as well, you've suggested you have done in the past, Sophie, but it's one of those things that you know, I do do quite a lot. And I, it's not out of some ego thing, but it's, it's a metric. It's a metric that I follow for the business, making sure that we're visible and we're getting found for the things that we want to be found for. Okay. Well, I will pop the links to both of those in the show notes as well to make it super easy for people to connect with you. So thanks again. Sounds great. Thanks, Sophie. Thank you for listening. If you're serious about growing your profile, take our free profile assessment quiz to see where you're at right now and get hints and tips on how to improve your score. You'll find the link to the quiz in the show notes. If you've enjoyed the episode, it would be mint if you'd subscribe, like and leave a review. See you next Monday.